Hello, everyone, and welcome to Deep Learning with Polly AI. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about Brand's role in the Contact Center, and I'm joined by no better than Kylie Whitehead, who is our Senior Director of Brand and Marketing. Kylie, welcome back. Hi. So we have, um, just for our audience, we have a friendly rivalry going on um, between our, our CEO and Kylie. Um, just in terms of the amount of views that her podcasts get, um, she has an incredibly popular one out with our um, machine learning, like their most senior machine learning uh, scientist about the evolution of speech generation. Um, and so please check that out if you haven't. It'll just help tick things in Kylie's favor and um, just motivate, I think, our CEO even more to do more of these podcasts. Um, awesome. But today, our topic is very different. It's a, it's a less technical one, um, but no less important which is really about the role of brand uh, in the contact center, a place where brand feels a lot more aspirational um, than operational, um, a place where we think there's going to be a lot of disruption and a lot of change going forward. So just want to start there. Like, let's maybe talk about the state of the brand today, um, where it sits, if it even is in the contact center and to what extent. Uh, Kylie, what do you think? Yeah, I think when you... When you think of the like the biggest brands in the world, right? Think about companies like Coca Cola and Nike. Um, these brands put like so much effort into really creating really engaging, really immersive brand experiences on the sort of front end when you're buying from them, right? They spend so much on advertising. They have so many like digital campaigns, really, really interesting stuff. Um, and then you call up the contact center and it could not be more different. And I did this the other day. I called up the top 10 um, consumer brands in the world. And um, every single one, first thing you hear is a recorded message. This call mm. may be recorded for training purposes, which, okay, we're all kind of used to that. Then we've got another recorded message, which is something like, have you tried going online? <laughs> um, then you've got the IVR, press one for this, press two for that. Um, and then finally get put on hold to speak to a representative. And each of the companies that I called up, it was at least 60 seconds before I even got placed on hold to speak to a representative. Yeah. So I'm trying to buy something. You know, I want to buy something from them. And they're like, yes, I will move heaven and earth for you to make this purchase from us. And then mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, I've got a problem with this product. And they're like, nope, don't want to talk to you. Go away. Good one. No, and that seems to be the dichotomy of, of brand generally. It's like they will spend a ton on acquiring you. Um, and less on retaining you, they will spend a ton on making sure that you receive the product, but the second it's time to return it. Um, I really think that this is just like a, you know, forever brand challenge is just figuring out how to keep the same energy that they have at the top of the relationship all the way toward the evangelist phase, all the way toward the, the, the entire life cycle of a customer. And I think um, from my perspective, like one of the reasons why this is so hard and why brands really struggle with this is because they, it's a technological capability issue, um, in, in my opinion. So IVR is what you describe in the beginning, where it's just like, I had to wait 60 seconds to actually get to the meat of the conversation, to actually get to what I wanted. Um, you know, that's that customer effort, the amount of like work that you have to go to to get toward the brand. I, I don't know how much I blame, you know, the, the company for that. I, I don't know how you think about it. Like, whose responsibility is it to make sure that brand is in the contact center? Yeah, I think you said a couple of interesting things there. So the first is like the amount of effort that you put into getting a new customer versus retaining a customer. But you see a lot of marketing teams are putting loads of effort into referral marketing, right? Like I, as a consumer now, I am expected to, if I like a product, I need to write a review. I need to send it to all my friends. Like so much is expected of me. And that is you know, that same part of the relationship, that's about loyalty. That's about um, yep. advocacy, like you were talking about. So I, I think it's, there is this sort of um, split between the marketing team or the customer experience team who maybe have these objectives of optimizing this experience for purchase versus um, this customer service team who could very well, you know, be a channel for evangelism. Yeah. Um, Should be. So I think that's really... Yeah, I, I think that's really important to keep in mind. And then I think even before the technical um, problems in the like brand and customer engagement, I was on the phone to the student loans company the other day 
Um, and I was on hold 50 minutes, five zero, nearly an hour. Um, and I finally got through and I spoke to this woman and she was amazing. She was really, really nice. She was really, really helpful. But um, she needed to put me on hold to go and talk to someone else about the problem I was having. And um, every two minutes, she had to come back on the line and say, yeah. I'm just talking to a colleague about this. Can I put totally. you on hold for another two minutes? Totally. And it was so, the first time she did it, I'm like, oh, that's nice. And the fifth time she does it, I'm like, this is so weird. Yeah. This is You're a strange me my... interaction. Yeah, totally. Totally. And it's, um, it's, sorry, I was just going to add that like people, you, you read all these articles about call centers and customers are always apparently saying, oh, I just really want to speak to a person. I just really want that like relationship, that warm, lovely relationship. But the way that contact centers are often scripting is just stripping everything human out of that interaction because they're trying to create this consistent brand experience. And I, I think you end up with something that feels very, unhuman even yeah. when there are people people behind it and then you sort of get into the technological problems as well and, and i think back to your original question of, of whose fault is this i think it's 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 this concept of separating all of these people all of these teams and all of these responsibilities when actually you're all sort of in it together to make a brand experience but it, it doesn't work like that budgets don't work like that management of totally. like that and, totally. and perceptions from the ceo don't work like that yeah i think that that I couldn't agree more. And um, I think if there's one thing that should change from here on out, it's seeing your contact center as a strategic brand asset. Um, and unfortunately, what that usually means, you know, for every, you know, customer experience leader, or for every marketing leader that thinks about brand assets, you know, things you can interact with in order to make a purchasing decision or a referral decision or a revenue adjacent decision these things tend to be places where you roll out campaigns. Um, and that's sort of like the way that you define whether or not this is a brand touch point. I can roll out a campaign in a brick and mortar store. I can roll it out in an app or a push notification. I can roll it out in an email. I can roll it out on my website. Um, but when you think about the contact center, the closest thing we have to a campaign touch point is, uh, you know, offering somebody a credit card. Uh, once they, yeah. you, you know, like once they sort of get to the end of the call and it's like, oh, by the way, did you know we have a uh, we have a loyalty program or we have a, you know, a credit card offer that we can give you. And like, that's really not what I mean. I'm sure it's not what 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 you think of when you think of brand, um, you know, but but if you actually test this idea that the contact center should be a brand asset, what do we think it means? I mean, I think for me. It means that the contact center becomes a place where the customer is not only known at the time that they're sort of having that conversation. And so we can sort of predict a little bit about what you need, what you want, a place where we can be proactive, a place where we can meet you in exactly the problem or the issue or the question or whatever it is that you need to be solved and not keep you on hold and check in with you every two minutes because somebody told me that this is how great brands are run. Um, but it's also a place that's, that's, you know, personal and and productive for me. So I in order to do those things, this is sort of where I kind of think about the technological capability um, piece. It's just not set up that way. Um, and so I don't know, I don't know if that's how you see it too, but it's it because of the, the silos that you were talking about, you know, and the people and the budgets and sort of like the hierarchies that stop it from sort of being connected with the rest of the brand. Um, that's one issue, but I think too, it's nobody's ever hooked up. I, I, I actually just saw a stat that said only 5% of their enterprises have a customer listening, um, mechanism in place that includes their contact center, that includes voice as a channel. Um, and I think cause just cause it's not digital, it's not been digitized. It's not something that's easily mineable or hook upable, um, to the rest of a, a company's customer data. Um, and I know that you have opinions on this too. So just would love to hear them. Yeah, I think like obviously for, for so long, I mean, the call center has has always been a cross center, right? Like it's always been viewed that way. And it times have changed a lot in the last five years. Um, call volumes have gone up. People are expecting more. Budgets are being cut. Everything is kind of working against the contact center at the moment. Um, and so I think people have have historically turned to these technologies and I mean, they're still turning to these technologies. Let's be real. If we could hire ever, enough people who were really, really great over the phone and they didn't churn um, and we could afford that and we could manage that and it wasn't an operational nightmare, we would do that. 
Um, I think that, you know, that is always or historically has been the preference for how you would handle that. Um, but it's just not been feasible for all the reasons I just listed. And yeah. so you've had to turn to to technology. And really, the IVR was released in the in the 70s. Um, speech recognition IVR became popular in the 2000s. I think I mentioned this on a past podcast, like influenced by that Seinfeld episode that came out in 95. So it, it's really after that that we saw um, speech recognition IVRs. And then we've seen basically nothing until the yeah. last sort of five, five years. Um, nobody has been innovating in the voice channel. And that's been because it's been hard. Like it's just yeah. really, really difficult. People talk differently. There's background noise. It's so unpredictable. If I was typing this out to you, I would write it in a nice, concise format and I would edit it and I would make it make sense. But I'm talking to you and words are coming out. Totally. And I don't know what I'm going to say next. You have no idea. Like, I don't know what I'm going to say. So how could you possibly? The beauty of private. Um, <laughs> yeah. And it's just been really, really difficult to automate. So, so then companies have had to say, okay, well, let's try and move people into digital channels. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot to be said for that. That whole student loans thing I mentioned earlier could have been avoided if they'd actually had any level of digital support online. So now it is important to have those, those different touch points, those different channels. Um, yeah. You know that. Oh, sorry. No, go on. No, I was just going to say some, to something that you said, um, our, our, our CEO, Nicola, consistently says, you know, brand is the brand. Voice is the most intuitive channel. It's the channel that we feel the most comfortable with. Thought comes in. It's out of your mouth. It's much easier than sort of doing the translation process from your brain to your fingers and, and chatting. Yeah. Um, and I think because of that, brand innovation on voice is so important. So you talk about the fact that it hasn't been innovated on in forever since like since the 90s it sounds like in that Seinfeld episode um and yes you have AI like but it's really just AI interpretations of bad old process from the 90s um and bad old scripting and bad sort of like KPIs that don't match up with an actually great experience um it's just innovation and automation on top of kind of like bad logic but I was thinking this sort of like very weird thought and I'd love to get your your take on it which is just when we think about who likes the voice channel and, and this, this concept, which doesn't seem to line up with data, so I'll just caveat in that way, but this concept that Gen Z and, and, and young generations don't really like interacting on voice. They'd much rather go to a subreddit and be like, is this normal with this product? Or how do you make this work? Or how do you connect this to that? Um, they'd much rather watch a YouTube video that teaches them how to do that so that they never have to interact with a person. So not even just like, digital sort of self-service channels, really just like brand experiences that don't are not owned by the brand. And I was thinking about this. If voice is the most intuitive channel, right, which I, I kind of agree with too. Um, I'm like you said, like so much more careful when I'm thinking about what I'm writing, thinking about what I'm asking and saying. But if it is the most intuitive channel and you could just call up into, you know, voice assistant that is um, powered by AI and has access to those same exact subreddits and can actually say, hey, you know what? A lot of customers have exactly this issue and this is this tends to be the most popular way to resolve it. But adding that sort of like human layer or that that human intelligence or that experience, that wisdom, sort of the wisdom the brand, that the brand has uniquely, which is to say something like, if you do that, it'll break, actually. You know, a lot of people talk about this, but if you do exactly that, you know, whatever, you know, that it'll impact the product or it'll impact something. Um, and adding that brand wisdom on top of what they could go out and find on their, their own. I think that that, to me, is a huge innovation on voice that would engage a lot more people, a lot more people that, you know, shun voice because of the hold times, because of the weird sort of like behaviors that don't line up with what, what the customer wants. Uh, so I don't, I'm just curious about what you think, like what does innovation look like on voice? Yeah, I, I mean, that's really interesting. And I think people are already moving into that way of searching for knowledge using ChatGPT. So, yeah. um, you know, if you go to a WeWork and you look at somebody's computer, I've seen, you know, people who are younger than me, you know, saying to ChatGPT, what's another word for this? And I'm like, that's, that's wild. I, I just Google, synon you know, word synonym. That's, yeah. that's how I do it. But there's a new generation of people whose first instinct is to go to ChatGPT and say, do that. Um, and that's great because that surfaces all of your content. You can make so much use of like user generated content to 
to create that feel of community and people helping each other out getting invested in your brand i think that that is very powerful um but at the same time you have no control over what that is what people are saying about your brand are they just saying oh yeah don't buy this product it's it's rubbish you shouldn't get yeah. it um yeah. so being able to to combine all of that sort of user generated content all of that third party content with your own kind of set of rules about which bits of those you can pick out to respond to which questions where is it useful to use that versus where is it useful to to use stuff directly from your knowledge base and then being able to apply this this um this tone of voice over it and this feeling that you want to inject into it as well like is your brand informative or is your brand um like bubbly is your brand friendly and you, you see this thing in contact centers where people can't they can't say sorry because it's like admitting that the, the brand has done something wrong mm. um which i think is another instance of where it just if you know if your brand identity is supposed to be friendly well you would say sorry to a friend if you had done something to, to inconvenience them and so there's there's really this disconnect between this these like quite i think rigid um psychological ideas or concepts that people have taken to sort of mean let's don't say sorry because they'll think you've done something wrong and that i think it's i think it would be interesting for brands to challenge those ideas and think how can we create these sort of personal connections yeah. through a more natural way of speaking yeah definitely um that's in, that's really interesting the thing i didn't actually ever register the fact that brands you know generally do not like to apologize because it's them taking on accountability and responsibility for, you know, for what they're hearing. I know that there's the way that a brand says sorry oftentimes is in the form of a transaction. It's like, here's a coupon, you know, for your, for your, yeah. you've been on the, 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 the phone for a really long time. You know, here's, here's a coupon. Here's a, here's some sort of gift basically for your pain. Um, and I wonder. Yeah. And saying them. Um... I was just going to say a lot of the way that brands and like verbally, the way that they say sorry is that's, that's so frustrating. I can understand that that's so frustrating. And how patronizing is that? How, like, wouldn't you just rather they said, oh, sorry, we messed up. Yeah, Thank totally. You. Because that's a human thing to do. Like that's, that's really what you expect. Honestly, I think that the brands of the future will sound more like they will, yeah. they will sound more like that because the way that it exists now, I think brands are up against just such an incredibly difficult challenge because what is a brand, right? A brand is the way that you feel when you think about or you conjure up the image of that company. And the way that you feel is impacted by literally everything. It could be impacted by the weather. Um, and so I'm, I'm just, just even, even at uh, the National, Na National Retail Federation event these last two days in New York, um, you know, I was listening to a talk about, you know, weather, weather analytics and how it affects demand and how they think about service and all of these things. And I'm just sitting there listening like, wow, you know, brand leaders, uh, people who really have to contend with absolutely everything that goes into the way that you feel about a company. It's not just service. It's the product. It's the manufacturer. It's su the supply chain, the cost, inflation, like literally a brand sometimes has to answer to the federal, like the, the, Fed's rate of inflation, because like that's associated with the way that they're seen in that moment. Um, so anyway, like the fast forward to the actual point, I think that brands are just going to have to get more human and more empathetic, more personal if they actually want to compete. And that does not mean personalized offers. That does not mean, Michelle, I saw you browsing, you know, these nylon strings guitars. Um, so we're going to send you a pack of, uh, you know, strings because we know that you generally need to replace them every whatever so much, so many months. That's not really what I mean at all. I mean, the people actually understanding the context with which I'm coming to you uh, when I call or when I browse a website, connecting all those things together, stitching them together so you have a better picture of, of really who I am and what I want, and then meeting me on every single channel, including the contact center. Um, and that's something that I, I didn't hear a lot of. I heard a lot of data unification talk uh, at, at NRF. And this is retail, which is, to me, usually the most advanced industry in terms of how they think about the customer, how they think about um, marketing and how they think about, you know, actually delivering uh, on that promise, on that brand promise. And even there, you know, the contact center was really not a channel that was being associated with, um, yeah, with the, with the brand experience. 
Yeah, I when you talk about the feeling, and I keep kind of taking this back to how things are done now, because I think there's there's this perception that if, like I said earlier, if you could just have people answer all these questions and do all this, that would be the optimal solution. And I, I think in a lot of ways, it's it's not. Like I have not, I can't think of a single instance where I've phoned up a customer service number right. and my first impression hasn't been, this company does not want to speak to me. Every single thing, that recorded message, that IVR, that getting placed on hold, you're just telling me you don't want to talk to me. Totally. But you tried so hard when you were trying to sell to me. You did everything, everything you could to get me. And now yeah. I need you and you're not there. Like, that's yeah. not fair. And, and then when you think about the way that, that people um, in the contact center are allowed to speak, I'm like, I'm a nightmare when I call up customer service. I always try and make jokes. I'm like, I'm really stupid about it. Um, and the person on the other end of the line, like they can't really interact really with me. And I, I kind of want some feedback, right? I want them to make me feel good about myself. I want them to laugh at my jokes. I want them to create that feeling that we're relating. Um, and they're just not allowed to to create that feeling, which I, I think is is really interesting. And I think, you know, with the with the way that technology is moving, um, I think that's the whole contact center experience is going to, like you said, get more personal. Um, and I think it's going to feel much more like speaking to a hotel concierge than calling up um, a customer service number where it's a lot more proactive, where it's a lot more, um, a lot more like relational where you're able to say, hey, these are my concerns. These are the things that I'm thinking about. How are you going to, you know, what should I do next? Yep. And make sure that I have access to all of that information to make those those really smart decisions. I, and I think that that's an advantage. Um, it's going to sound very counterintuitive, but I think that's an advantage that AI will have over, over people by far. The ability to sort of be personalized um, with a much higher degree of, of context and knowledge about the person that they're speaking with. I think, um, you know, a lot of tools that have sort of evolved out of conversational AI, like, you know, agent assist technology that sort of pops up the customer profile and tells you, hey, this person actually hasn't shopped in a really long time. They returned this product. Um, you know, this is this is a context. Now go have this conversation and hopefully, you know, what we've armed you with better information. Um, but I think AI gets it gets a chance to go one step deeper than that. Um, because it's not just here's all the context. It's here's why we think they're calling. Here's where we last saw them struggle. Here's what people like them tend to do. Um, and then also just listen, just actually listen. You don't, you don't need to come and, and kind of prescribe something to them, you know, preemptively. You can actually just listen, take in that information yeah. and, and, and use it. And I think the best brands um, are, do two things. Like one is, you know, stay true to their roots, stay true to the core. They understand themselves well. And so that they don't do missteps because they understand their own core values from a brand perspective. But the second thing they do really well is listen and learn, is like actually pay attention to what the customer is saying and how the customer is reacting to those things that they're putting out um, and then adapt based off of that. And you can't really do that on the voice channel today. And again, I go back to this technological capability issue because so many ways in which you might understand your contact center are for, from things that are from human input, just like a drop down of why did this person call? What do we think that they wanted? How long did it take, you know, for this call to get resolved? Um, and all the KPIs, again, are at odds with the thing that would make the customer truly happy, which is validation, to your point, to, to being, to being yeah. feeling heard. Um, and that's some, this is unfortunately something that uh, I say unfortunate because uh, the industry hasn't really caught up to this, but it's something that AI does really, really well. I'm um, just curious about your your thoughts on that. Like, are we going to be able to be more human because of AI? Yeah, I think so. I think when you say more human, maybe more more personal mm. in a way that is like, you know, I I can tailor the way that I speak or or what I say to you because I know you, um, and therefore we can have a more productive conversation because we have that understanding of each other. Um, and I think that's what AI is going to allow brands to do is have those like one-to-one -one relationships with customers and I think um you know a lot of brands are already trying to collaborate with customers by you know actively getting feedback trying to get customers to um participate in their social media presences like to really take them into the brand 
Um, but I think AI is going to allow for this kind of more passive but more natural approach to that mm-hmm. collaboration where you're, you're, you, know, you are actively listening to what customers are saying and making adjustments within the company. There was an example of um, Paul from FedEx was talking at Vox, our, our conference, um, late last year. And he was talking about this concept in FedEx where potentially, you know, you might see that, okay, 60% of, of, um, of calls relating to overseas deliveries um, are because of, of X problem, right? And the problem uh, in this instance might be that they didn't check a box on a form. And you can, you can optimize the heck out of that process, that customer service process, right? You can, do, you can make the most amazing uh, process to solve that problem, or you could just fix the form. Right. Um, right. That's the thing that needs to happen. So when you take that in mind, you know, all of this information is currently sitting in the contact center. I don't know who's in charge of making that form, but do those two people ever speak? Like being able to surface this data and make it go to the right places is going to, I mean, it's going to change how, how contact centers are seen within the organization, right? You're, you're already sitting on this, this like massive pile of really, really great customer data. And you're going to be able to, to give that to the rest of the organization and drive yeah. real change. Yeah. And I think that has always been, I think contact center leaders have always known that they have that. And I think they've always felt like, well, if, if only people would ask me, I know the answer to that question because I listen to the customers totally. and they just don't get asked. And I, I think we're in for a big change in that way that's going to enable that level of personalization, which is going to enable really great customer relationships and that feeling of collaboration, which is, is going to drive loyalty at the end of the day, which is what it's all about. Yep, absolutely. Loyalty, value for each of those customers, that value going up. Yeah. Um, you know, see the one, one thing, so, so actually to summarize a lot of this stuff, like what does it look like when a brand, um, is an actual asset, you know, oh, sorry, where your contact center is an actual asset for your brand. Um, what might that look like? So you said something, which I love, which is just basically like this repository of data is teaching the rest of the business something about itself. Like we don't know exactly what, but it's teaching the business something it's rising sort of the business intelligence that's based off of actual customer, like the, the actual customer's mouth. And I think that that's probably thing number one is just like, how can you take that data and leverage it to learn? Um, and what that learning means on the other side, that's up to the brand, that's up to the business to sort of decide. But that, that's one thing. I think another thing that you mentioned too about loyalty is actually being able to, um, like for me, being able to, to attach a CSAT score or an NPS score, however you measure sort of the the quality of your contact center, being able to map that back to revenue. I think that that's going to be another sign that the contact center has risen to the level of strategic asset for a brand. It's just, do you understand how much money this, this center is driving for you, is supporting for you, is increasing for you? Not just, you know, cost savings, optimization, you know, all of the, the operational sort of language and KPIs that are around the contact center, but really like, what, what is this driving? Um, from a business perspective. I think, too, um, the degree of personalization that came up a lot today, too. I mean, but just that degree of personal um, interfacing between you and the brand um, and the quality of that personalization. It's not just about being nice. Have you ever heard the the difference between being nice and kind? Have you ever heard people talk about that? No. So so I I love it because um, I I consider myself more kind than nice. but there was a time where it was the exact opposite, where I just was like such a people pleaser, like just just like make people happy at all costs, even if it's completely unkind to myself and technically unkind to the other person. So like the best example of this is kindness is telling somebody that their fly is unzipped or they've got like, you know, spinach in their teeth, whereas nice is just like polite conversation and just being like, oh, I didn't want to embarrass them. It's like, yeah, but you set them out into the world to embarrass themselves with multiple other people. So it's anyway, so there's this difference between nice and kind. And I think that that's the brand shift that we want to see. We don't want to just be nice to our, ourselves as a brand and not apologize for things, not to take account, not take accountability for things, but actually show kindness and like true empathy, true feeling, true care yeah. for the customer. Yeah. And I I think the way that that will come about is by, you know, brand, brand doesn't just come from marketing. And I say this 
as a brand marketing person, right? That, but that is, I am not, you know, entirely responsible for the brand of Poly AI. Every single person in sure. the company is responsible for, for upholding this. And I think in a, in a contact center, you need to have some, you need to have some space to interpret the brand in the context of customer service. So if the brand is friendly, you need to be able to think, okay, looking at my scripts, looking at all my prompts, would I say this to my friend? Because if I wouldn't say it to my friend, is it friendly? Or, you know, whatever those brand attributes are, being able to have that, that kind of freedom to apply them in that context is what's going to allow for that separation. Because I think at the moment, a lot of this stuff is maybe coming from a marketing team, for example. Sorry to dunk on marketing so much. Um, but that is coming from marketing and then being implemented in the contact center without that really contextual understanding of what that experience, like how you could deliver that experience in the contact center. And I think the more contact center leaders start to take ownership of that, start to feel, um, to be empowered to really interpret the brand in that way, that's going to enable them to deliver really great experiences with people, um, with voice assistants, and then with all sorts of other technologies that are, are going to be working in the background to, yeah. to you know, improve efficiency and, and experience. Could, couldn't agree more. And I think just as we as we close this out, um, the idea that the contact center leader has just such a tremendous role in this change and this sort of transformation that's happening in the contact center, finishing that work of the, sort of the digital transformation of, you know, the COVID times like 2020, 2021, 2022, and turning their contact center into a place that is mineable, that is digital, that is valuable. Um, I think that they have a big, big role ahead of them. I think that there are, you know, great partners out there that think in the same type of way. Um, but it's, it's a, to me, extremely exciting because the future is just better for the customer. The, the customer has not enjoyed the voice channel, even if they preferred the voice channel. They haven't enjoyed the voice channel in a really long time. If forced to research, yeah. it's to be, to be believed. Yeah. And it's, you know, the customers, the customer's going to be happy, which is going to make your agents' lives happier because they're not dealing with people who are stressed out all the time, which is going to make your management happier. You're going to collect all this data, which is going to make your bosses happy. It's going to make the organization run more smoothly. Like you're, you're just going to have, I think you're going to see contact center leaders having a lot more impact across the rest of the, the business. And finally, getting the recognition that they have been looking for for the last 50 years. Absolutely. Love it. Well, we could talk about this all day, and I think we will probably want to do another another discussion about this. Uh, it's a super interesting topic. Appreciate your time, Kylie. Thanks for being on our show. Thank you. Bye, everyone.